Good evening and thanks for joining us for CBS News Detroit at 7. We are streaming free on the CBS News app and Pluto TV. I'm Amir Makeupson. Tonight we are once again continuing the conversation on youth and mental health. Earlier this week we were joined by several experts in the field to cover a wide array of topics including depression, anxiety and even suicide. Here's a look back. This feeling of being worthless is just sort of intensifying every day. I just don't know where else to turn it on. Because like, I, I just like lie here and my head just spins. You know, not wanting to get out of bed or not wanting to see my friends. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people in our community are dealing with like intergenerational trauma yeah. on top of living in this society. Yeah. You know, the constant microaggressions, the constant racism, the constant discrimination. Like gatekeepers and stakeholders, the people who have the power in society aren't actually listening to youth. What are they telling you that they're feeling? Well, a lot of depression, uh, a lot of anxiety. Kids who, especially after the pandemic or during the pandemic, developed anxiety disorders yeah. and depression, um, having a hard time communicating with their friends. There was substance use. It's not like the old days of smoking in the bathroom. Uh, driving recklessly, bad behavior at school. Costly coping. This is where kids manage in ways that have a cost associated. So they're using substances or they're tearing at the fabric of relationships or they're harming themselves. Or even becoming more withdrawn, changing friends or disassociating with things that once brought you pleasure. What I'm concerned about is the amount of time spent on social media. I think social media uh, in some ways of just constant negative images and the kids are absorbing all the time. with. Social media being so prevalent in children's lives, uh, many of them don't really understand the consequences of it. Soon she started to believe she was bipolar, had borderline personality disorder, and ADHD. According to one analysis of popular TikTok videos about ADHD, 52% were deemed misleading. Families actually are sometimes give up their kids to foster care to take advantage of the superior resources and services that are in the foster care system. There aren't facilities where unless the kid, I mean, that, it, that can serve kids who haven't broken the law, haven't gotten arrested, whose parents aren't, who haven't given up parental rights, right? There are no, there's no real system for that. This lawsuit, we're, we're suing the state to stop that. Well, this isn't to beat up on the state of Michigan. It is an issue beyond state level. We provide services throughout all of Wayne County. They can also call our, our local Macomb County Crisis Line, which is 24-7. We also have a mobile, mobile crisis unit that actually has somebody deployed to the home. We cannot exchange services. Typically, no, the, our mobile crisis unit would be primarily going to Macomb County, correct? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. If there is a Wayne County family in crisis right now, can they call you? They can. In the last maybe five years, increase in suicide and attempts at suicide. Is there a single cause? Is that even fair to ask? How many of you in here this school year currently this school year have you already heard a classmate talking about and entertaining the idea that maybe I should just take my life, raise your hand high, hold them high, man. The amount of hands that went up, um, but something that could not be seen in that particular shot is some of those kids were very young, very young. There are not just clear cut warning signs all the time, are there? No, there's not, and I, I know Personally, plenty of uh, children that have exhibited little active signs and have, have suicided. We just want to okay. emphasize again, if you or somebody in your family is experiencing a mental health crisis, you can dial 988. They speak multiple languages and are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, if you missed it, you missed a lot. But over the course of the hour, we're going to speak with even more experts and families who are tied up in the mental health system. Stay with us. We'll be right back. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit. 
But we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this and more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock. That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. News Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit. Live, streaming, and on demand. Building a better newscast, one story at a time. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Oakland County. It's here, the new CBS News Detroit. Covering every corner of our community. With experienced journalists, uncovering the stories that truly matter to you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. And weather experts, always looking ahead to prepare you for what's next live streaming and on demand with more hours of local news coming soon southeast michigan news whenever you want it right here on cbs news detroit weekdays at 5 6 and 11 and streaming live Welcome back. Welcome back. You're looking at a newly released statistic about youth and mental health from the CDC. Overall, mental health with our youth is suffering. Now, young people and teens spend most of their productive hours of the day in school, of course. And so to help us understand what our academic leaders are doing to ensure that kids have access to mental health care in and outside of the classroom, our two special guests. Joining me now is the superintendent of Dearborn Public Schools, Dr. Glenn Maleko, and the executive director of Special Populations, Mike Isaley. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank Appreciate you. the opportunity. So what type of mental health issues have you all noticed in the school system? Yeah, I could say that we've seen an increase, uh, depression, anxiety, you know, the pandemic has brought out a lot. Um, depression, um, you know, it's really taken to the point where we really need to invest in those resources and we've done that. We've seen, you know, social media, all the, you know, adverse situations students have been dealing with, especially when we came off where there was virtual learning for quite a while. Right. And, and that's been tough on everyone, you know, families, uh, on staff as well. So yeah. we've been really working hard and I know we added Mr. Saley's position actually pre-pandemic and we're glad we did because he's really been taking the lead with grants and addition, additional social workers we've added since I've been superintendent we've doubled the number so that we could provide support for our students okay and in what ways have you helped to do that so I think from from our perspective is you know I could tell you that prior to the pandemic we started engaging in many different um, professional training and learning opportunities for our staff to where we're building very positive cultures and climates within the school system um, for some of our students so they can all feel that self of welcoming and belonging. Uh, we know students who struggle with mental health or even trauma um, when they're in their previous lives, you know, really want that safe environment to come to school. So we started working with, you know, restorative practices. Uh, we trained about 10 to 15 people to be restorative practice trainers within our district. And in turn, uh, we trained uh, many of our buildings, including, you know, teachers, social workers, counselors on restorative practice approaches and how to build that healthy culture and climate. Um, post pandemic, we really focused on trauma informed instruction. Um, how does trauma present in the classroom? Uh, what are some skill sets? What are some strategies that our staff needed 
to help um, work with our students who are dealing with whatever trauma it may have been, whether it was a result of the pandemic with the isolation, the loss of a loved one, or many other issues that you know we may be seeing um, in the school system as well. So is it fair to ask both of you that the resources and the plans that have been put in place now are both proactive and reactive? Correct. I mean, I think even during the pandemic, you know, we came up with a hotline, you know, when, when students were at home so that students can call in. And so we're training staff on how to do that. But being proactive, absolutely. And I think one of the things that we do as well is listen to our students, that student voice. So I have a student advisory council. Um, and so I'm always in connection with them, whether it's through WhatsApp, their social media, but they meet with me on a regular basis. So I'm learning from the students and some of the things that are important to them and what we need to do. What are they seeing with their fellow students and how can they lead? And it really is, an, uh, my council is an example of, you know, all students from within the district. It's not just your high achievers, it's those that from that diverse population and some of the, you know, things that they're seeing. And some of the things that they tell me too are, you know, remember our, as adults, we're role models for the students. So when we see, you know, whether it be our board meetings or whatever's going on in the public or on social media, we gotta remember that we need to support our, our students, the students are watching. Yeah. And so I think that's very important, listening to that student voice. And then when there is some kind of trauma or situation, we do have a, a plan in place where we bring in support into that specific building if there was some sort of tragedy that a family may suffer and we're ready to go. And Mr. Saley has really done a great job with his entire team, with our social workers, our counselors in the district, um, also our teachers and everyone just to say, hey, we need to support each other. And then again, I think that mental health too, you know, for adults, making sure, and so we work with our unions and we have support for our staff as well when they're dealing with traumatic, traumatic situations because we know that our teachers or our bus drivers are also parents with right. students. But Mr. Asaley, are you noticing that there are issues even in the younger classes as we get down even elementary school age. Yeah, there's definitely been a spike with some of the, the behaviors that we're seeing, you know, especially, you know, in the kindergarten, first grade um, age. And that's where we're trying to be as proactive as possible. Um, you know, in previous years, you know, under the leadership of Dr. Malik on our current Board of Education, we've increased the number of social workers. I could tell you in previous years, uh, we didn't have a full-time social worker at every small elementary school. Now that's something that we do have, and those resources resources are available there. Uh, we're also looking at different um, programming and how to support our students the best way possible because uh, they are displaying a lot of different behaviors that could be related either to mental health or trauma, um, isolation. Uh, we know the world is changing. Um, there, you know, technology is at the fingertips of many of our students before they even enroll, you know, into school. And you know, what are some of the things that they're seeing, you know, within the technology? Um, so we're trying to be as proactive there, um, not only to equip our teachers as to how to handle some of these situations, but also ensure that there is the resources there uh, to where we can continue to work not only with our with our students, but also their families as well. And that's something that we have tried to do and put an emphasis on is, you know, just recently last month at our PTA council meeting in the district, we had a couple mental health experts from our own district, you know, speak to parents on, you know, what the mental health look like at home? You know, what are some strategies? What are some coping mechanisms you can do with your, with your children at home? And if you're seeing, where are some outlets to, to help support them? Uh, we've partnered with many great organizations and agencies in our community. Uh, to help support, you know, our mental health within the school system, you know, uh, access. I'll give you an example. Our, we have offices of social workers that access is providing um, to help students and bridge that kind of that gap with the mental health and make it as accessible as possible. We've also piloted a new recreational therapy program to LAHC. Um, as well, which is another local organization, uh, just to give another outlet or avenue, not only for our students, but our families as well, because we know sometimes the issue could just be that, access to some of these mental health supports. Right, so it's, you know, you guys have the kids for a certain amount of day, obviously it will spill over into home life, so it's important that parents are very well aware of what's yes. happening too. This was so brief, but I appreciate you so much, both of you, for being here. Thank you so much. Well, we will be right back after the break, this time talking to Southfield Public Schools. Don't go away. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock, in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit, but we don't just cover the news here. 
We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this and more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock. That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. News Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit live streaming and on demand building a better newscast one story at a time cbs news detroit on your block around the clock in oakland county it's here the new cbs news detroit covering every corner of our community with experienced journalists uncovering the stories that truly matter to you making a difference in your neighborhood and weather experts always looking ahead to prepare you for what's next live streaming and on demand with more hours of local news coming soon southeast michigan news whenever you want it right here on cbs news detroit weekdays at 5 6 and 11 and streaming live Welcome back. In the mental health crisis, young girls are seemingly hit the hardest. Another statistic for you from the CDC. We are joined now by the superintendent of Southfield Public Schools, Dr. Jennifer Green, and the executive director of Intense Student Support, Dr. Lanissa Freeman. Thank you both so much for being here. In the last block, we talked a little bit about some of the issues that the young people in the Dearborn district were facing. Have you all noticed anything in particular in Southfield? Absolutely. Our students were facing crisis pre-pandemic and with the onset of the pandemic, it really exacerbated those issues, um, mainly because students were not able to socialize with one another outside of a computer screen or a cell phone. And that was that's an important part of youth development. We've noticed that with their return to school, they are lacking the ability to engage with one another and to engage with the adults around them. Even as an adult, I felt the same. It was Absolutely. difficult for me when the world opened opened back up. Absolutely. And and truly has the world returned back to pre-pandemic? Yeah, what is normal? It it is not normal for our students, yet we expect them to behave in a manner yeah. whereby they are able to engage, able to learn and erase what has happened or not happened in their life over the past several years. Yeah, because it's been tough on everyone. So what kind of programs do you have in place for the younger students, elementary school age? Well, we're very fortunate that we have full-time social workers in every elementary building to support our, our students. So um, not only our students, but our staff members, as well as our parents. We've been very intentional. We have a full staff of psychologists, counselors on hand. And prior to the pandemic, we were very um, much engaged in mindfulness support and helping children to use the strategies of calming down and, you know, breathing techniques and yoga. So we've been very fortunate to embrace that not only during the school year, but during our summer programs. In addition to those individuals, 
that when we returned from the pandemic, we also implemented academic and behavior specialists at the elementary level yes. as well. And we now have Zen centers in many of our schools mm -hmm. where the students can go and have that time out in order to regroup and go back into their academic classroom. And is that something that they can choose to do or is that something that if they have an outburst, a teacher might direct them to do? Both, it can be self-selection and or the adult can identify the need for the student to go and take that time out. We were looking for alternative solutions to suspensions or alternative solutions to, to address the behaviors. We also have a full-time health clinic in our high school that services not only the students in the high school, but any Southfield Public School student. Uh, it has an ex external egress for the families within the community to directly access the center. It has a full-time nurse practitioner and a full-time counselor through our partnership with Ascension Hospital. So we are most fortunate that we can provide services on site and families don't have to look for those services outside of our district. Well, do you think that families really have a good idea of what their children are going through? Many of our families are struggling as well. We've put additional supports in place not only to support the students but to support the families. We have a very strong area council PTA that we work with um, almost on a daily basis. We also have a virtual time with our families whereby they can join and ask any question that comes to mind and sometimes we do hear some extremes and we try to provide those wraparound supports. We also have student support coordinators in our district to provide those supports be it for uh, food scarcity, clothing scarcity or any other issues that our families may have but definitely that of the mental support we work with our police department and some of our local agencies on a community critical response team if any of our um, partner agencies have to go to a home to address a matter relative to the adults they contact me as the superintendent and let me know this child may need some support as well based on what we witnessed in the home okay. and that's that's unique to our district usually mm -hmm. we don't know that something is occurring in the home unless it manifests itself in the classroom yeah. this way we are able to take proactive steps to provide the student with support before any behaviors manifest themselves and what are the, some of those behaviors behaviors maybe that some people would be on the lookout for? You know, just non-compliance, uh, mm -hmm. task avoidance. Um, Regression yeah, of ab behaviors. Absolutely. Uh -huh. um, yeah, just defiance really, but we've been intentional about manipulating our environment. Mm -hmm. So now we actually have pedal desk. Mm -hmm. You know, we have wiggle noodles so that kids can have the movement, natural lighting, um, fidget kits in all of our classrooms so that, you know, if you just need a break, if you need mm -hmm. to um, walk, um, very intentional about um, making sure children are hydrated. So we have hydration stations. So mm -hmm. things that you can do just to kind of support the learning environment in a natural way yeah. so that students know it's embedded in the curriculum as well as for our staff members that just need a break. So we have sensory rooms yeah. in addition to those Zen rooms. Okay, and in what ways have you seen this is making a difference? They fight for the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> I would <laughs> fight for a Zen room. That's right, right. absolutely. And absolutely. It's, it's working. I mean, the students are responding to it. So we've been um, investing in more types of um, environmental friendly desks that are more comfortable for children, mm -hmm. um, making sure that we're um, minimizing the um, fluorescent lights. It causes mm -hmm. hyperactivity in children mm -hmm. and just being intentional about getting natural light into our learning environments and a calmingness in terms of um, how we invite kids to feel like they belong. And we yes. must mention our furry friends. We have Therapy yes. Thursdays whereby <laughs> our, our um, partnership pets come to the schools to work with our children as well. And they we have 100% attendance on Therapy Thursdays. So that is something Yes, and therapy dogs that are full time in some of our in buildings. In some of our buildings. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And so for those at home, if you want to see that, go to cbsdetroit.com. <laughs> I did that story on the therapy dogs. Yes. And it was it was a great day for me too. It I is. walked out smiling and mm -hmm. happy. I mean, the kids just react to that. People really yes. kind of underestimate the power of just a little fuzzy friend. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. It well, ladies, it has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us about all the great things happening in Southfield. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Well, coming up, families with children entangled in the mental health system are going to join us and share their story of getting their children the help they need. Stay with us. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock, in Macomb County. 
Hi, we're CBS News Detroit. But we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this. And more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit. On your block, around the clock. That's right. Local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit. Live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. News Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit. Live, streaming, and on demand. Building a better newscast, one story at a time. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Oakland County. It's here, the new CBS News Detroit. Covering every corner of our community. With experienced journalists, uncovering the stories that truly matter to you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. And weather experts, always looking ahead to prepare you for what's next live streaming and on demand with more hours of local news coming soon southeast michigan news whenever you want it right here on cbs news detroit weekdays at 5 6 and 11 and streaming live Thanks for staying with us for CBS News Detroit at 7. On your screen are some tips for how you or someone you know can cope during a mental health crisis. We're joined now by two moms with children entangled in the mental health system. You may recognize Laura Marshall. Her son now sits in a juvenile facility, juvenile detention facility undergoing mental health treatment. She was a part of our special report on CBSDetroit.com. And Deidre Artecki, who is struggling finding any resources at all at the state level or through private pay for your children. And now this is an impossible question for you both, but briefly, can you give us a little recap of what you've been going through? through. Laura, I'll start with you. Thank you. Um, so we actually have been in pursuit of services for our son for years. Um, we realized right from when we first met him as he has adopted um, that there were attachment struggles. So we started early, early on and it's, it's just been an ongoing challenge. Like we have had lots of suggestions over the years to, you know, do therapy, do counseling, um, try this parenting method, reach out to this person, you know, try that, read this book. Um, and we just are not, you know, we were not able to successfully find anything that really clicked, that really made a difference. And now, you know, as he's getting older, what we find is um, the initial, as, as we pursue new services or supports, the initial response we normally get is finger pointing at parents and blaming the parents. Um, after you kind of get past that stage, it takes a while to prove yourself that it's not your parenting. Um, you get to the stage of, um, you know, just, well, it's behavioral. Mm -hmm. So my question is, if you have a mental health challenge, how else is it going to show up than through your behavior? Mm -hmm. So they're hand in hand. You can't separate behavioral. Um, but we've been denied many services because it's claimed that it's behavioral or it's it's a parenting issue. Right. And for you, Deidre, what's for, going on? For me, same. Um, my son is adopted out of the foster care system, and he showed signs at a very young age of mental health struggles. So we've had him under private pay insurance and had him under psychiatric care and 
had therapy all these years and he hit his teenage years and he really spiraled. Uh -huh. So I um, tried to access our local CMH and get some uh, SED waiver for him to get some more intensive in-home services for him and uh, was denied, not once, but twice. And they said he was not severe enough. It wasn't long after that, then he is now involved in the juvenile justice system because there was nothing to help with his behaviors. Mm -hmm. And even then, when I applied, they said he's not severe enough and that if he was involved with juvenile justice, that there would be more services. And that is not the case. On Monday, we heard from our, the CMH Executive Director, Bob Sheehan, um, who, who admitted that there are gaps in the system. So to be clear, though, to clarify, you all did not choose to put your children in the juvenile justice system. Correct. Absolutely no. not. How does it get to that point? Oh, um, it, it takes years and it takes a whole lot of, unfortunately, professionals um, sort of passing the buck. Um, essentially, you have this child that has very significant mental and behavioral health challenges and you're asking for services and, and you, so our family did get involved, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, our local CMH and we did get what's called an SED waiver for severe emotional disturbance. Which is what you were not able to get. Correct. Yes. Okay. And so once you, you're um, in the CMH, you know, you're supposed to have this array. It, it's, it's federally required that they offer services. They're list stated. There's, there's, it's a federal contract CMHs hold. And, but when you actually go to ask for, I need respite. Like, I don't want my son to go, but maybe if we had the federally authorized level of respite that we need, maybe we could get that break and sort of recharge and then back in the mix. Like, our son's here and we're working with him and we're working with therapy and we're working with equine therapy and sports therapy and, and all of these things. And yet when it comes down to it, what we get is, well, there's not really a provider available. Um, there's not um, anyone to safely provide the respite. The, but these are things that are federally guaranteed and at the outset, CMH staff will tell you that it's there, it's available, but when you actually are in and you sign up, they sort of shrug their shoulders and say, huh. And so what happens as time goes on, your, your youth potentially gets older, we don't have the money or the resources to private pay for um, like a, a residential. Mm -hmm. And because Michigan has virtually nothing, you call a crisis line that's supposed to be available 24-7, I mean, one of the reports earlier talked about how there's 24-7 crisis through CMH. I called and I got told, oh, well, you already have CMH services, so just call them. Another time I called and, oh, well, that those hours are done at 6 p.m. Or, or whatever it was. Well, I'm sorry that my child's crisis is not happening during your convenient business hours, but our crisis is happening now and we need you and so essentially well you have no other option when there's a big enough safety issue you have to call the police on your child what does that do to a mother it's heartbreaking is your son in state Deidre he is currently yep I know that yours is out of state yeah. um, and how do you sleep at night either one I, I it's difficult. I imagine. It's it's a difficult roller coaster, and it's not anything that I would wish on anybody. It's difficult. So, what's next for your for your boys? Currently, my son is on probation through the courts. Um, I did have someone at CMH actually tell me that the court system has a bigger bucket of funding and a bigger bucket of options, so we should go that way. So they weren't willing to offer us anything beyond that recommendation. So that forced us to continue with the court systems. You are criminalizing your child. You're, you're calling the police. He has a police record. Mm -hmm. And my son sat in juvenile detention where there's absolutely no therapy, no counseling, no anything to support him until essentially they said, well, he's not safe to go home, but he's essentially 
taking up a bed or space here in juvenile detention. So they, um, they sent him to a program out in the state of Wyoming. So now your son isn't even drivable in a, you know, in a case of an emergency. I mean, you are in a totally separate place. From the very beginning, one of the first diagnoses we received for him was reactive attachment disorder, which takes the ability to sit face to face and work with him on things like eye contact, um, you know, feeling safe in our home. But he's now in the state of Wyoming. I can't work on any of those attachment pieces because he's hundreds of miles away from me. Mm -hmm. And I don't really even know exactly what therapies and counseling he's receiving there. I know it's better than him sitting in juvenile detention, but is he really getting the help he needs? I, I don't have that assurance. And as you said, it, it absolutely keeps me up at night. I have never wanted my son to be taken out of the home from me. I wanted the help that we knew he needed early on so that we never got to this point and that my son would have stayed far, far away from the criminal justice system. But nobody would help me help my son. And so the last place I ever wanted to find myself, here we are. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so much more to say and to ask. It, it, it just breaks my heart as a mom. But what I do want to say to both of you is, this is maybe over for now, but it's not over for us. We're going to keep following up to find out what's happening with your children, how they're doing, and what we can do to help. So thank you both so much for being here. Well, coming up, representatives from two area community mental health agencies are going to come to set. We'll have their response when we come back. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock, in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit, but we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this, and more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock. That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. News Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit live streaming and on demand building a better newscast one story at a time cbs news detroit on your block around the clock in oakland county it's here the new cbs news detroit covering every corner of our community with experienced journalists uncovering the stories that truly matter to you making a difference in your neighborhood and weather experts always looking ahead to prepare you for what's next live streaming and on demand with more hours of local news coming soon southeast michigan news whenever you want it right here on cbs news detroit weekdays at 5 6 and 11 and streaming live Thank you for staying with us tonight. Mental health knows no boundaries. You're looking at possible warning signs now of a crisis from the CDC. 
Joining us now are two community and behavioral health service, oh, I'm sorry, coordinator for the Macomb County Community Mental Health, excuse me, I messed that up, Libby Vutzi, and president of the Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network, Network Eric Doa. So we just had what we all just said, that, that was heavy, what we just heard. Um, but coming from you all, how are you limited in what you can offer families based on where they live? Sure. Um, so we, we certainly have to follow Medicaid rules and guidelines when we're, we're offering services to individuals. Um, you know, Macomb County is a CCBHC, so we can provide services to people outside of, of for certain services outside of um, Macomb County. Um, but you do typically have to be a resident for some of those more intensive services, which is what the two moms were just talking about, was mm -hmm. a very intense level of services. And we have to go based on our county parameters um, and then Medicaid guidelines. And so that does, and, and there's certain criteria that have to be met and things like that, which is oftentimes very frustrating for a parent. Right, so what has to happen, uh, Mr. Doa, for that sure. to change? Sure, you know, um, this is what I will say. You know, being a parent myself, I recognize that when your child is in need of, of care, Imaginary lines or border lines should mean nothing to you. And at Detroit Wayne, that's what I've tried to really enforce to our staff. Let the CEOs and others, let us deal with whether it's COFERS and all of these other things, fancy words that folks like to use. As a parent, that's not, that should not be your concern. Your number one concern should be, where can I go to get my you know, child you know, that help? And so when you talk about some of the challenges, I think the challenges really truly come about when folks don't know that there are options that are out here. And so we are that, we are that last resort, meaning there is no wrong door. So if you go to a CMH or a PIHP such as Detroit Wayne or Macomb, you are going to get served. Now, I know that we can talk about you know how if you live in Oakland County or you live in Macomb or you live in Wayne County, you can only go there to receive services. That is true on a whole, but no one's going to be turned away because you go to a certain CMH that is not within your county to be served. That should not be the case ever. Mm -hmm. One thing that I do also want a clear understanding on, would somebody in CMH ever recommend that you criminalize your child? Absolutely. to get services absolutely not we, we you know our program I mean we're, we're community based we're by nature right all yeah. of us are community mental health so we want children and and individuals to be in the community to provide supports to them to be able to have them in their home mm -hmm. because that is where a child would be most comfortable sure. and and um, you know they have the support of their parents or, or caregivers or you know aunts uncles whoever it is that's providing supports to them so we want them to be in the community so that we can help them stay with their school stay with their friends all of all you know with their natural supports we want them in the community but what can moms do like the two that were here who have heard otherwise from their CMH which is not your CMH mm -hmm. and so now we're getting into the here there and everywhere do do they have any options absolutely look just as when you are looking for, you know, that, that particular doctor, you know, or, or physician that is perhaps out of the network, you know, what you sometimes do, you call your insurance company to find out, hey, can I go outside of the network? I think as a parent, and again, you have to put yourself, you know, no matter whether you're in this field or not, as a parent and say, mm -hmm. hey, I need services for my child you go to that CMH and you will not be turned away and if anyone is turning folks away who are coming into their organization to receive services truly shame on them because mm -hmm. that's something that we should resolve at the very end and these are your taxpayers dollars at work I mean I would never want to get on television or, or, or have any of my colleagues tell me that we turned someone away because they were from another county. I mean, to me, that is one of the most you know, horrible things that can ever happen, especially when you find yourself in a, you know, a crisis situation or regardless of that. I mean, at the very least, if there is a service that we cannot provide because there isn't a provider in that particular network to do so, then you make the referral 
to a you know to a neighboring CMH that will be able to offer that. But to turn someone away, uh, truly, I think that is tragic within mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. Well, this is now day two for me, um, sitting with representatives from the Wayne and from Macomb CMH, and and both times I can truly feel you know the love and the compassion mm -hmm. that you all have. But that doesn't seem to exist from the parents that I've spoken to who live in Kent County. So is it fair to say that not all agencies are the same? I think it's more than fair. But at the same time, though, I think you also have to note geographic locations and limitations sometimes of services and providers that, that are in that particular network. But that shouldn't be an excuse, though, because at the end of the day, you know, whether you come from Macomb, Kent County, Wayne County, Oakland County, you know, we all deserve that level of care that no matter where you are, you should receive that. And I think that's some of the things when we talk about, you know, standardized care, it should be at the forefront. And, 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 that's, and that's something at, as CMH is, we should be really pushing for it so that no matter where someone goes for that care, they can receive that same level of adequate services. Right. Now, before we wrap, do you all have any final thoughts? I would just say that, that um, to piggyback off of what Eric was saying, I mean, I think community mental health, every staff member within our agency and probably Detroit Wayne too, um, wants to help. We, we want to help children. We want to help other individuals in general. And so, um, you know, I would just say to contact our, our um, access point, you know, our 855-99-MCCMH to get services. And we will do what we can to, to link, whether it's in our county or out of our county, we will do what we can to, to help an individual or family or child get services. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the same is true, you know, that our 1-800-241-4949 number, no matter where you are, we will extend that help to you. And I know for our folks in the Access Center who are probably looking at me a little cross-eyed, it is the truth, though. And I, you know, and, and, and truly, there are just certain levels when you reach as a parent or just being a parent, period. Mm -hmm. You just instantly recognize recognize that type of care and that type of concern and worry that another parent must feel and go through when you know their child is faced with such a critical situation yeah well I appreciate you both so much I can I literally can feel the compassion and the empathy and I just appreciate you so much for being here um, I hope that if there is a CMH that is encouraging people to go to, to Juvie or, or any other place, like they said, they're experiencing in Kent County, shame on them, that should be criminal. And I wish there were more people like you running these agencies and getting families the help that they need. Thank you both Thank you. so Thank much you. for being here. Stay with us after the break. We'll be joined by a current Michigan representative and a doctor in just a few minutes. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock, in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit, but we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this, and more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock. That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. News Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit live streaming and on demand.
building a better newscast one story at a time. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Oakland County. It's here, the new CBS News Detroit. Covering every corner of our community. With experienced journalists, uncovering the stories that truly matter to you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. And weather experts, always looking ahead to prepare you for what's next. Live, streaming, and on demand. With more hours of local news coming soon. Southeast Michigan news whenever you want it. Right here on CBS News Detroit. Weekdays at 5, 6, and 11. And streaming live. Thanks for sticking with us. If you or someone you know is having a mental health crisis, dial 988 for immediate assistance. That is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, there's a concerning statistic highlighting the issue of mental illness in policing in particular. According to First Help, more officers die by suicide than in the line of duty. Our race Strickland has more from our police union. I was saddened by it because uh... Uh, there were two good people. That Police Officers been. Association of Michigan President yeah. Jim Tiganelli yeah. says most officers' suicides occur after a critical incident, such as a murder or mass shooting. He says many officers reached out to him after the shooting at Michigan State University. That night, I got some calls from our officers that were there that saw some things that they had never dreamt of and, uh, and, I, and to this day are still seeking some, uh, you know, seeking some type of counseling, treatment. Tiganelli says mental health has become a greater focus for law enforcement agencies over the years. He says there's now a new program called Frontline Strong, which will help officers with counseling, therapy, as well as training first responders in peer-to-peer -peer counseling. So it's not really just a bunch of doctors trying to help somebody who's got problems. They're trying to train police officers as peer counselors, firefighters, so that if a firefighter needs help, he's gonna deal with a fireman of a police officer or an EMS or dispatch. That's never been done before. Tiganelli says talking about mental illness and raising awareness about how it impacts law enforcement is the first step in reducing the stigma, letting officers know it's okay to not be okay. In Detroit, Ray Strickland, CBS News Detroit. To wrap up our discussion now, we have two very knowledgeable people, Michigan Representative Mary Whiteford and Dr. Farhan Badi. Thank you both so much for being here. What needs to happen at the state level to get some change? Because Dr. Badi, I know for you, as an internal medicine doctor, you're treating mental health patients who have no place else to go. And for you, Rep. Whiteford, I know that you have been pushing legislation. So what do we need to do? So I find there's three things. Number one, thank you for having me. But access to care, an infrastructure for people to go to, and then the professionals to do that work. So it took me five years to get the Michigan Crisis Access Line up and running to be the most comprehensive hotline in the nation. And last summer, we were, in, we were told to make our hotline 988 or to offer it, so we just folded it right in. So we're actually, How because awesome. of my personal experiences, we're most posed, poised to do that. Yeah. And when we talk about police officers, we actually have a contact point within there for police for officers police to call. Specifically. An ER nurse can call, a police officer can call to find out where to take a patient, a mom can call, find out local resources. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk about that, then we talk about the professionals to do the work. Right. So through the appropriations process, because I chaired the Health and Human Services budget, we actually set up, there's a MyDocs program to get more psychiatrists in high need areas, but also so pro programs to get psychiatric nurse practitioners through Wayne State University. It's now the new hot major. Wow, They that's have incredible. built up every single spot in there. Yeah. And then over at Michigan State University, they set up a program where 250 social workers can get trained to staff crisis centers. Wow. So we talk about that. And then we talk about infrastructure. I was able to um, get $325 million in the current year budget, um, totally prioritizing children, access to care, crisis centers, um, homes for human trafficking victims, mm -hmm. um, support for autistic kids. Things that we people have don't even think about. All of these things are part of our problems with the mental health system. Yeah. So they're all getting built up right now. Which is wonderful. But until but, that happens, right, a lot of those people are going to doctors suffering. like Dr. Body. I know. Yes, and which but, is not to say that he is not right. capable because you are a very intelligent man. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Body, how do you treat mental health 
children, well, patients who, who are children, um, as a primary care physician? So primary care, I'm a family medicine doctor, it's a very broad specialty. So there are some primary care doctors that are really passionate about mental health like I am, and we sought out the knowledge and the training to become competent in taking care of a whole variety of mental health diagnoses for adults and children. Mm -hmm. There are other family doctors, primary care providers across the state and across the country who trained in an era where uh, anything beyond simple depression, they wanted to refer that out. Mm -hmm. And so they might have skills that I don't have. They might be better at cardiology or they might be better at nephrology, or, but they don't feel comfortable treating mental illness in-house. So for those patients who have providers in primary care that aren't comfortable treating mental illness, and not just your simple depression, but anxiety, PTSD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, those are all things that we treat in my clinic, mm -hmm. adults and children. Uh, and if you don't and have- And that technically, though, is not what you went to school for. No, it is what I went to school for. It is, for. that, okay. Primary care- Is everything. Is everything. Okay. And you can seek out the knowledge to become comfortable and competent to treat bipolar disorder as a primary care doctor. Mm -hmm. But not every primary care doctor has those skills or that knowledge. And so if you are a patient who's seeing a primary care doctor who doesn't feel comfortable treating bipolar disorder and you happen to have Medicaid, well, they're gonna refer you to CMH because that's the only place you can go. And if CMH does an independent evaluation and says, well, you, you're only mild to moderately mentally ill, you're not severely mentally ill, they're gonna turn you away. So where else can that person go to get the care that they need, to get the medications they need, to get the re referrals to, to therapy uh, that they need? Uh, so fundamentally, the system is flawed. And the biggest problem with the system as it's designed is that CM CMH has a monopoly with Medicaid dollars. Mm -hmm. And as long as that continues to be the case, as long as individuals don't have a choice for where they can go, I mean, it's not just that, that they have a monopoly, it's that you can't even cross county, county lines. Think about how ridiculous that is. Think about if you need to see a cardiologist and you live in Macomb County and your Medicaid tells you that you have to see a cardiologist in Macomb County, even if there's a really good cardiologist in Wayne County. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. You're not allowed to go there to see that. It's yeah. the only area of medicine, mental health, where you, where you can't even cross county lines, where, where literally your services are dictated by the county that you live in. And there, you know, there are some CMHs across the state that are more capable than others, that have more resources available to people than others do. Mm -hmm. And you can't even drive an hour away to go to another CMH because right. of the way that the funding's set up. So, Pardon me, Dr. Body, I'm getting a hard rap, meaning we have to cut it off and go. Thank you for joining us. We're going to continue this conversation, though, in, the, in stories to come. So stay with CBSDetroit.com, and we'll have all the details there. Thanks for joining us.